I brought uh, two. It's Friday. <laughs> we love Friday. It's Friday. We love Friday days. Because Friday is the day we get to do civil procedure. And also, it's Labor Day weekend, right? So you get an extra day off for Labor Day for the same reason that you have a weekend in the first place, which is the Xbox as well. Uh, it's the benefit of the, what the labor movement has uh, brought uh, to society from the early 1900s. The Great American Labor Movement. Speaking of the Great American Labor Movement, this is what's happening in the world around you. The Bennett administration is, it's not appropriate. <laughs> the Bennett administration has filed a motion to remove the judge. Can you file a motion to remove a judge? Yes. Sure you can, because you, you're limited only by your imagination what you can ask for, okay? and how mad you think you're going to make the judge. Or, or not, in this case, right? Um, so he's made a motion to remove the judge over liking something on Facebook. Um, Facebook. I will tell you that this motion is unlikely to be granted, in my opinion. And I'm certain that Bevin's counsel knows this. He's a very smart lawyer. Why would you make a motion like that, knowing that it's unlikely to be granted? Yes? Yeah, yeah. You want to bring it up to the appellate court, right? Who's taking two, three, four steps ahead? And what's the PR value in making a motion like that? Now you can say everything that the judge does is against you from that point on, because the judge was biased against you. If you're making a motion to, re to have them removed because of something I like on Facebook, may actually be true. All right, let's talk. Motions to dismiss, right? 12B motions, specifically. But we'll get into the other letters, too. This is easy, right? Simple. Simple. As usual, the reading kind of makes it a little more complicated than it has to be. When you get out into the real world and you start doing this stuff, it's pretty simple, right? You're the defendant. Remember, defendant's had on for a couple of class sessions. You're the defense lawyer. You get served with a lawsuit. And then you start thinking, as good defense lawyers do, how do I get rid of this case? How do I win this thing? Well, you can win a trial. That's good. You want to cost your client a couple of you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars. Take all the way to trial, win trial. You can win a motion for summary judgment. And it usually happens after you go through all your discovery, taking fifty depositions, responding to written discovery, going through all your pretrial stuff, maybe so on and so forth, right? And at the end of a summary judgment motion, you say, plaintiff doesn't have the proof that they need to take this case to trial. The judge says, yes, I agree with you, win the case. Or the quick way out: motion to dismiss under Rule Twelve. Everybody understands the difference between those things. We're going to talk a lot more about summary judgments before you get done with the semester. Okay. Hi. When you make a motion to dismiss, you're saying that there's some sort of legal deficiency in the plaintiff's case. Okay? There's something wrong with it. And that thing that is wrong with it is so wrong that the whole case has got to go. Right? The whole case has got to go. And what that requires you to do is to play on the plaintiff's turf. Your defense counsel, you have to accept the facts as pleaded by the plaintiff. To what extent you have to do that with a motion for summary judgment, too, we'll see. But you're really stuck with plaintiff's facts on a motion to dismiss. And what you have to say on a motion to dismiss is that even if everything that plaintiff says is absolutely 100% true, still there's something that allows me to win this case right off the bat. Okay? That's the motion to dismiss. The motion to dismiss says, here's that thing. Here's my legal argument as to why everything that I just said is bullshit. Right? The motion for summary judgment, the way to think about that as compared to a motion to dismiss is that usually this happens after your discovery period, right, what we said. And so what you're saying is, here's all the facts, Judge, that we came up with in a discovery. And under those facts, and the applicable law, of course, the plaintiff can't win their case, for some reason. The standard is, for those of you that have worked on this before, I'm jumping ahead, but the standard on motion for summary judgment is that there is no genuine issue of material fact for a jury to decide. All the issues of fact that could have been decided by a jury have come out in discovery, here they are, just so happens that they favor the defendant, and you should toss this case. Okay, that's your motion for summary judgment. Trial. Well, I've got this version of the facts, and there's a competing version of the facts from the other side, and they're both my choices, but we're going to convince the jury that our version of the facts is correct. You see how it's different? Kind of, sort of? <coughs> Get more into it as we go, especially with the summary judgment stuff. Because you'll probably spend a lot of your clerking life, and your early lawyer life, and if my career is any indication, your late lawyer life, responding to motions for summary judgment, and responding to motions to dismiss. Now, if you've done that a few times, you'll understand it. Now, what goes into your motion to dismiss? And serve the complaint and file this motion to dismiss, what can I put in it? Well, the easiest thing you can do is go over and look at this laundry list that's been helpfully provided for you in the rules of civil procedures, specifically in Rule 12b, right? Every defense, claim for relief, and any pleading must be served in the responsibility if one's required, meaning put all the stuff in your answer that you can think of. Right? That's the plain English for that. But the party may assert the following defense in our motion. Lack of subject matter jurisdiction. If you know what that is, right? If you're paying any attention last semester, you know what that means. What are you saying when you're saying there's lack of subject matter jurisdiction in the case? <coughs> yeah. Be well, this, this court can't hear it for some reason. Right? The court doesn't have jurisdiction over it because the court doesn't deal with the kind of thing this is. Bonehead, you filed your bankruptcy case in the state court. Right? 
state courts don't have subject matter jurisdiction over bankruptcy actions. Therefore, we'll just talk about that more than that. Like personal jurisdiction, same kind of thing. The proper venue, insufficient process, insufficient service process. Jump up to failure to join a party under Rule 19. You very rarely ever see in the wild, although I think I provided you an example of that. And the catch all, right? Well, B6, failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. And that's probably how you want to look at 12B6 as a catch-all, right? If you can't think of any other ground under 12B that applies, it's probably 12B6, right? Classic example being, well, the classic, I say, since about 2010. Classic example being an Iqbal motion, an Iqbal slash Wanley motion, right? What are we saying in Iqbal? An Iqbal motion to dismiss, you're saying that there's been a failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted because the plaintiff hasn't set forth a plausible claim for relief, right? We got that. Clear as mud? It's on my bingo card. So most of the kind of motions you're going to be making, if, God forbid, you end up being civil defense counsel, are 12 6 motions, okay? Let's see. So bars to recovery, absolute bars, the plaintiff being able to recover. For example, the statute of limitations is already run. Okay? This statute of limitations ran five years ago. The plaintiff is an idiot. Therefore, a motion to dismiss. 12 6 statute of limitations is an absolute bar. Absolute immunity? Say, for example, if you sue the governor, right? You sue the governor for common law tort, or even a statutory cause of action for which there's no waiver of immunity, our courts and their infinite wisdom have said that governors in most states have absolute executive immunity. You don't get to sue the governor. Right? You're like, well, we just saw a news story where the governor was being sued. That's it. But beyond the scope of this class, right? Motion to dismiss based on immunity, at least absolute immunity, something that doesn't require any factual proof whatsoever. It's a good example of that kind of thing. Find the governor and they say, look, everything that the plaintiff said in their complaint, let's assume that it's perfectly true. Fine. But I get immunity. Right? I get immunity. Therefore, the case must be dismissed. I'm not going to defend this thing. It's stupid. The jury can't award any money against me. Okay. Think, for example, here. Let me talk about plausibility. Think of, think of these examples. Right? The plaintiff pleads intentional infliction of emotional distress, but fails to plead that the defendant suffered severe emotional distress. Is that enough for you to file a 12 v. 6 motion? Is severe emotional distress an element in the act? Let's assume that's an element. Yeah. I think so. I think so. The plaintiff doesn't say why venue is proper in court and was filed in. Is that enough to file a 12 v. 6? Or 12 v. 1? It falls under one of those categories. Sort of. What do you think? You could. You could. More often than not, you're talking about a strategic decision with these things. Okay? You're talking about a strategic decision, not um, whether or not you can. Because again, a 12 v. 6 is about anything, just about anything, will fit under that. Especially when you consider it falling fondly. As plaintiff's counsel, are you going to get hit with motions all the time under Iqbal and Twombly, no matter how complete and how thorough your complaint is, yes. that says, well, in this one paragraph on page 75 of plaintiff's complaint, eh, they don't state a plausible claim for relief. Yes, of course, we get that kind of stuff all the time. So you have to think, how critical is it that you really think, again, the first rule of civil procedure is, no, I judge, in this court, do you think that your motion to dismiss is going to be ruled upon favorably? That really is a big consideration here. And then if you make your motion to dismiss, what good is it going to do you in the context of the overall litigation? Are you really going to win because you made that motion to dismiss? What do you win except for a very large bill for your client? Maybe not. I don't know. Go ahead. Um, are you saying in the second bullet point that the legal bars are bars like 12B6 motions? Yeah. Yeah, you can make a 12B6 case on it. Mm-hmm. And the first two are more or less unusual with a plausibility one the whole time. Okay. And remember, because we know this because of, what, two classes ago? Last class? I don't remember. All the days running together. We know that the plaintiff can't amend as a matter of course. If you file that motion to dismiss, you're still within the statute of limitations. Even if you're not still within the statute of limitations, unless you think that the plaintiff doesn't have a very good shot at getting their amendment through, it really makes sense to you. Now, in some cases, it sure does. Yes? Um, if a motion to dismiss causes a plaintiff to uh, go past the statute of limitations, I mean, is that, is that something that is up to you as far as taking that into account? Is that what happens? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, okay. In theory, right, you file a motion to dismiss. You're defense counsel. You file a motion to dismiss. You're just beyond the statute of limitations. The judge is considering your motion to dismiss, and in the meantime, you receive a first amended complaint. Right? That amended complaint should operate as a matter of right if you're within that 21 day time period described by Rule 15. Right? If you don't get that amendment, though, then you won't. Right? There's no amendment as a matter of course. So for some reason, the plaintiff has already amended once and can't amend as a matter of course. The judge says, you, you look at that, you're considering, the judge rather is looking at that motion to dismiss and considering it. If the judge grants a motion to dismiss, even without prejudice, you're refiling. The plaintiff then can't refile because of the statute of limitations. Does that make sense? Everybody follow that? Kind of? Sort of? Yeah. So again, a lot of this depends on how mean you think the judge is. Right? And, and again, I think you've got, there's a passage in your book that says, uh, under Iqbal and Twombly, when we talk about our pleading standards, there's a passage in your book that says, the judge is not likely to just throw out a case on a motion to dismiss under the plausibility standard without giving the plaintiff an opportunity within the context of that case to refile the complaint, right? That is not my experience. And the judge can depend on where you are, depends on who you're in front of. But can the judge get a motion to dismiss and then toss the whole thing? 
leave you high and dry. Any on-session limitations? Sure. Sure. Right, when do you file this? Well, as a defendant, you probably want to get on it as soon as possible. But as we said, there's strategic considerations there, too. Certain of these defenses can be waived by participating in the litigation. And certain ones can't. Okay. If already waives any defense, listen, Rule 12b-2-5, notice what's missing from that is 12b-6, which can sort of be raised any time we'll talk about that. If you don't make it, if you don't make your defenses under Rule 12b-2-5, the enumerated defenses that are there, in a motion, right, or, and this is a big or, in a responsive pleading, your defenses that are laid out there, if you make them in your answer, most of the time you're probably going to be okay. Most of the time. Right, but say if you, for example, raise insufficient service of process in your answer, you think, ah, that's cool, I'll deal with that later. And then you go on to participate in discovery, <coughs> and to participate in depositions, and to hire experts, and do the kind of things that you do in civil litigation. But there's pretty good case law on that that says you waive that service of process issue, okay? So you lose that. You probably want to have a certain kind of early on, even if you got it raised in your answer, okay? Now, subject matter jurisdiction is a notable exception here. You can raise subject matter jurisdiction anytime. Anytime. Okay. So you've been litigating a case for 10 years, and now on your third trip to the Court of Appeals, and all of a sudden you realize, wait, the court doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction. It never did, ever, at any time during the last 10 years. You raise that by motion, but then the judge is sick of seeing you and says, yes, that's right, no subject matter jurisdiction. You buy a case that's been here for 10 years. Is that possible? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Subject matter jurisdiction <coughs> can be raised at any time. It can never be waived, ever. Don't be surprised if you see a question about that on your final exam. A failure to state claim upon which relief can be granted. You can't raise that at the appellate court. Okay? That's not like subject matter jurisdiction. Can you raise it at any time up to and including trial? Yeah, kind of, right? but don't. Don't. You can make that argument. You can make that argument at trial with a straight face, and maybe sometimes you'll be able to. I think in most cases, you're not going to wait until the last minute you've been litigating this case for two years and say, ah, oh, wait, wait, hold on. I don't want to take you to trial, Your Honor, but the plaintiff has failed to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. I don't think that the judge is going to look upon that very favorably, okay? unless they really like you and don't really like your opponent. No, you have to raise it in the lower court. Right? Yeah. Not like subject matter jurisdiction. Oh, you mean you're saying, can you go back and go to the court and say, hey, I raised this at trial. Yes, you can do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You want to preserve anything you can. It's got to be raised at the lower court, though. That's the important thing. Yeah, I was just thinking, would it be possible to use that as a strategy when the statute of limitations are not like you can do? Is that right? That's too simple. No, you could. Yeah. You could. We're talking about defense counsel. There's no such thing as defense counsel. Sorry, Lord, I wrote it. I'll bring you guys some defense counsel. They'll roast me. They'll slowly roast me while I sit here. Fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, that touches on this last point here, too. Does it make more sense to wait to raise these claims that you got? Um, for summary judgment. If you think that the judge is unlikely to dismiss right off the bat without doing a little bit of discovery, raise your defenses in your answer, and there's nothing in the world that stops you from bringing up that same stuff, including insufficient service process, by the way, <coughs> in your motion for summary judgment. And will there be a motion for some of your defense counsel? Will there be a motion for summary judgment before you get to trial? Oh, yes. Yes, there will. Right. I'm trying to think of cases I've seen, some cases in my entire career, where there haven't been a motion for summary judgment before trial. I can't think of very few. <coughs> I don't think I skipped over one. Defendant makes a motion to dismiss and argues an issue of fact. Right? Argues an issue of fact. So, for example, the defendant moves to dismiss your breach of contract case, saying, okay, cool, but what the, what the plaintiff forgot to tell you is that we never had an agreement on the essential terms. There was never a meeting of the minds here, and therefore, you should dismiss this case. They can't sue me for breach of contract. What can you do? How do you respond to this motion to dismiss? First of all, is it a properly made motion to dismiss? Like, um, isn't that something that could be answered after discovery? Exactly. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Right? That's how I would answer it. That's how I would answer it. Can you make a motion to strike their motion to dismiss? Yeah, but then you look kind of petty. Right? So what is the answer? You respond to the motion to dismiss. There could be many answers, right? I think the answer is respond to the motion to dismiss and say, look, that's an issue for discovery. It's an issue for discovery. Are you going to get a bunch of motions to dismiss that are grounded in some sort of fact that the defendant hopes you're not going to have to prove in discovery? You're not going to have to hash out in discovery? For sure. Is it to the defendant's best interest to short circuit litigation before you ever even get to discovery? For sure. Why would you do that? I mean, granted, there's no such thing as petty for some practitioners. But, but, no, I think, you know, it depends on who you're in front of. It depends on who you're in front of. It really does. You know, I think a motion to strike, in my experience, is generally not looked upon favorably. It's like, yes, answer, answer the motion to dismiss, counsel, because then you're making extra work for the judge. They don't like that. They got a lot of work to do as it is. So very often, the response to these motions to dismiss is, we got to do discovery on that. We get to prove this. That's an issue of fact. Yeah. Well, that's where I'm going with that. Yeah, that's where I'm going with Plaintiff's counsel, defendant makes a motion to dismiss. You can't prove the injury with due negligence and unintentional tort. You got a negligence action and an intentional tort action coming out of the same course of conduct? How can you do that? You got to dismiss at least some of that judge. And your response is? Clean water. Clean water. That's right. You can do that, remember? Remember? You drafted a complaint. So 
guys are pros at this. You can please, under rules, any alternative. Defense counsel knows that, but you get that motion anyway, maybe. You're the judge. Defendant files a motion to dismiss. You like to complain these claims, the third one, you think for some reason has gotten to go. Plausibility, sexual limitations, whatever. Does the judge then throw out the whole case? Is that what the judge has to do under Rule 12? Same groups that you're in when you draft a complaint. Remember what those are? Yeah? Maybe? Kind of? 
There were four or five of you in the group who drafted a complaint. That complaint, I promise you, was deficient in some way. Okay. And that's okay. Maybe not. We'll see. Take that complaint, find another group, serve that complaint on that group. Okay? As soon as you are served with a complaint, you're now the defendant. Right? I don't care what court you draft for. We draft a motion to dismiss the other group's complaint. That's all the something. Motion to dismiss the other group's complaint. Right? You can base it on a real deficiency. I would like it. it must be real Rule 12, right? You can't just make up your own Rule 12. Right? What? What about the one time to be? What? What about the one time to be? Let me the one that's not good. One time to be the one. Okay. Right. Do this. Wait, wait, wait. Don't start doing it yet. Okay. I have other stuff to do. Wait. Trust me, you want this information, okay? Right. So, if you're totally lost, right? Hey, shut up. Just a minute. I know you're very anxious to get started on this. Look at a couple of these, okay? With me, real quick. Um, the stuff that I shared with you on Blackboard. This is a memorandum of law and support defense motion to dismiss filed in Maryland court. Uh, they all kind of look the same. In some places, you'll see. This is a motion with a memorandum attached. Okay, fine. Um, that's kind of the format you'll see in most of the federal courts. Check your local rules. You don't necessarily need to do it for this exercise. I just want to see that you get out of power 12 right? Out of draft 12 motion. 12 motion. Some kind of least. Right? Uh, if you go through like, something like this, right? There's been a separately filed motion, document 30. This is an attachment to document 30, which is document 30-1. Sort of interpreting some of the stuff that goes on at the top. Uh, you don't need to worry about that too much. If you want to just draft up a memorandum, that's fine. Do you need to have a table of contents? No. Okay. Table of authorities? No. In many places, they will tell you you have to do this, like over in uh, Southern District of Indiana, for example. You go over 35 pages, you gotta have a table of contents, table of authorities, all that stuff. Right? Most of the time, you don't gotta have that. Okay. Introduction. This breaks it down. First, plaintiffs lack standing. You have no standing in the Congress. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh. Second, plaintiffs' claims should be dismissed for lack of rightness. What about rightness, Lucas? We talked about that. We talked about that. Doesn't matter. These are 12 v. 6 grounds, okay? The plaintiff, if everything they say is true, they lack standing, and so under the Constitution, they can't bring this claim. Okay? Plaintiffs' claims should be dismissed for lack of rightness. Same, same idea. Okay. Plaintiffs' complaint fails to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. Should be fairly familiar language you might know. And most of the examples I put up on the board, uh, on Blackboard rather, are going to have that kind of language in it, right? Motion to dismiss, verify complaint, in part. You have to be that specific with your, your heading, no, not necessarily. You just call it motion to dismiss. Preliminary statement lays out all reasons. You don't necessarily have to have any of this formatting at all, right? Unless it's required by local rule, none of this formatting, all this formatting is individual stylistic stuff, okay? So find a style of these things that you like and do it that way. Same with facts. Facts established blah, 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 are you standard review, standard review on motion to dismiss, which cites to fondly, right? Plausibility, any fault. A lot. Possible requirement claim must be dismissed because she has been no facts plausibly supporting such a claim. Typical, 12 v. 6, if all formally, have to stop. Would you do that to your opponent's complaint? Sure, why not? Or maybe other deficiencies too? I don't know. How do I go and find, really, you guys, you guys want to see something cool? How do you become the hero of your law firm, heroin the case may be? Well, remember your old pals, Weck, Lexus, and Westlaw. Let's do, let's see, motion to dismiss. Well, just for fun, we'll put the ball in here. Now, you can draft up one of these things from scratch if you want. You're just up for that kind of fun, don't have anything else to do. Or, rather than reinventing the wheel, <coughs> right, why not go down here to the trial court documents? Right? And then maybe, just so we have the latest case law, sort by date. And look at all this cool stuff that's available to you. Then, however, there's this motion to dismiss, claim to second amendment. These are actual motions to dismiss that have been filed in various courts all over the country. Okay? You know you can do this, right? Get in, pull the stuff out of there, especially in the legal standards. If you want to have in your motion, plop it right into your motion. Make sure that you haven't cut and paste, you know, like party names, and stuff like that. But there's a bunch of stuff here. You see how I got there? Can you use this sort of thing in your work with your law firm over the summer or whatever? Sure. Sure. <coughs> find stuff that's been filed by good lawyers, though, and not boneheads. Because you'll find both in here. Response to memorandum in opposition to what involved a motion for partial dismissal. If you're filing a motion to dismiss, make sure you're not coming in here and looking at a response to memorandum in opposition to a motion to dismiss. Or a reply, that's different. Everybody get that? Yes, it's helpful. Okay. Oh, all right. I'll just run back up. Get in traffic. <laughs> you need help getting a complaint 